Thank you for coming. Um, my name's Hannah Ely, and I'm a volunteer with the um, Montpelier Node of 350 Vermont. Um, before we get started, at any point um, tonight, if you need to get up, get some water, we have some seltzers over there. Um, if you need to use the restroom, it's right in the back to my right. Yeah, there's, there's two others. So. Oh, and another one here. All right. Wow, you got options. Okay. Accessible. That looks accessible. Okay. Great. Um, so thank you to the UU um, Climate Action Team for hosting us tonight. Um, we are the Montpelier Node of 350 Vermont, and we're a group of volunteers from around Montpelier um, who support 350's climate um, climate action. Uh, in the capital city, mostly during the legislative session. And we also host events um, like this one. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, I joined the 350 node um, a couple years ago, just looking to kind of move beyond individual action when it came to climate change. Um, and I found, found a really good community um, and enjoyed meeting up with everybody. So um, that's been amazing. And yeah, so thank you again to the UU Climate Action Team, and I will turn things over to Connor. Cool. Hey. You don't have to clap. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Connor Wirtz. I'm a community organizer for 350 Vermont. Is this better if I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna eat the microphone. Um, I'm gonna pass around a, a sign-up sheet, and you only get added to 350 Vermont's listserv if you, or like get contacted if you check the interested in getting involved button. If you just put your email and nothing else, all we'll do is send you one follow-up email with like answers to any questions that come up that we can't answer right away or things like that. So just being clear about what you're consenting to here. If you just want the one follow-up email, just do that, okay? What could you do now? Say it. What did you do? Oh, I fell off my bike. <laughs> so I did wear a helmet, though. <laughs> so um, today we're going to be chatting together for about like a little over an hour, probably an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and we're going to go through three sections. The first section is going to be a little bit about like Vermont's energy landscape and what are the factors that 350 Vermont uses when we sort of evaluate the energy that we try to like advocate for and the energy that we try to stay away from. Um, next, we'll move from that sort of the electron power to the elections power. Like what are the, the institutions and the bodies of power that we need to think about when we're advocating for a better energy landscape in Vermont? Um, and so it's not just about like the energy things, it's also about the people and the institutions that are influencing it that are really important to this work, right? So that's section two. And then at the end, we'll do a quick recap of some of the legislative bills that, are, uh, that were passed this session um, and a little bit of the story of like how 350 Vermont has helped organize to push those bills through um, through the state house. So um, obviously we're waiting for the veto session, so things are not totally resolved yet. So we'll give you like the best information that we have at this moment, if that makes sense. Um, but so that that's that. And then lastly, um, we said this event was from six to eight, and you might have noticed that I said we're gonna shoot to talk for like an hour and fifteen minutes, and that's because we actually want to spend a decent amount of time like being able to talk amongst each other about what we learned tonight and what questions you might have. So we have pizza coming in at 7.15, um, so we'll have food and music and plenty of time to like talk. Dancing? That's it. If you want to. <laughs> I could try to, well, Emma really likes salsa dancing, so maybe we can get that. <laughs> um, a couple quick words about this work, what this workshop is and what it isn't. Um, so it's not a climate change 101 workshop. Um, we're kind of coming in with the assumption that you all know basically that the climate crisis is real and that we really need to do something about it. And um, 
We're hosting uh, Roger Hill, the meteorologist, in August. Um, it will be in this space. And um, Roger's going to give us sort of like the most recent scientific review of, of the climate crisis. And um, it's going to be like tough to hear, but also probably really interesting. So check that out if you're looking for something like that. Um, I am going to talk about like a pretty critical lens on sources of energy that are called renewable. And that's an interesting thing. And it's a shift um, in the climate movement. To, because for the past 15, 20 years, we've said we really need to move off of fossil fuels, full stop, and period, go to, you know, good night. And as we're adapting and as capitalism and companies are adapting to the climate movement, they're now starting to like put in um, high like carbon emitting renewables as their main sort of alternatives to an energy transition. And so this is sort of like the newer edge of the climate movement is we really need to be thinking about what are the energy sources that our utilities companies are greenwashing or what are the energy sources that we're being told are climate solutions that, but that might not be as good as we really need them to be. So all that being said, this isn't a condemnation of like all energy use. We know this is really tricky and tough. And um, as a grassroots organization, we're just sort of like, these are the things that we think, and like, let's try to figure it out together, basically. Um, and then finally, y'all might have some questions, like, but this is mostly like surface level energy stuff, and really happy to go deeper into the weeds of like specific energy and policy things if that's like your your thing that you really like doing. Um, Three Fifty Vermont has volunteer policy teams that focus on electricity and transportation and heating. And um, they are really great for like getting in touch with if you have specific questions about all of that complicated stuff that honestly I, as an organizer, sometimes don't totally grasp, but great. Um, okay. So I mentioned that one of the key um, goals of today is to actually like get to talk to each other and meet and mingle a little bit. And so we're gonna get warmed up now <laughs> before we dive into the content. And um, if you're willing or able, I'm actually in a second gonna ask you to stand up and like move around the room so that you're gonna talk to somebody who you didn't sit down right next to and, and are probably comfortable with. And you're gonna do that and we're gonna meet three new faces tonight. And um, for each time you pause and stop, I'll tell you when to stop. You'll have like three minutes and you'll just get to answer these three questions. So number one is what brought you here today and what are you hoping to learn? So do we feel ready to get up and mill around? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> do it, do it, do it. <laughs> so walk around a little bit. If you want to, you can stay in your chair. That's OK, too. Keep walking. Hi. Okay, once you find somebody, introduce yourself and why did you come today? <laughs> Oh, yeah. 
Okay, folks, you're looking too comfortable, so I'm going to tell you to switch. <laughs> I'll go find another group, move around a little bit more, and the question's switching now. Uh, you can introduce yourself, but please also talk about how do you think Vermont's doing on climate progress?
six years ago to go to college. And um, I knew that like climate organizing was really important to me. It's something I learned about in high school. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll probably do some of that when I move to Vermont. But really, like, it's probably not that much work to do, right? <laughs> I was like, it's, it's a Green Mountain State. Like, we're all like environmentalists up here. So I thought it was going to be easy. And um, but the more I learned, it really really changed that picture of Vermont for me and um, realized that Vermont is lagging really behind all of our, our peers in New England when it comes to climate progress and climate action and not, not the leader that I thought we were. Um, now, some of these graphs are going to look a little bit different um, because of the work that we've done this legislative session and that's a really exciting thing. Uh, but th these are statistics from a couple years ago, but this is the per capita greenhouse gas emissions reductions. We all can't see the... Oh, am I standing in your way? <laughs> Sorry. I was trying to be nice about it. I'm not going to lie. And if you can't see, Vermont is that small arrow, um, kind of on par with the rest of the, the United States, um, but much doing less progress than um, all of our neighbors around New England. Which small state? Which, which small? The darker one, the fourth one. Oh, the darker one. Yeah. Um, there'll be a good amount of time for questions about content, but if there's anything about not being able to hear or see. Yeah. Well, on the chart, um, what is your incremental measurement? So is that the percentage? Per capita greenhouse emissions. OK, so it's per capita. Yeah, for sure. Um, and this is from the Energy Action Network, and they, they released an annual report as well. And um, from Renewable Energy Vermont, this was back in 2020, 2022, um, talking about requirements for new renewables um, to be produced in the state, and Vermont is also the worst in our region, um, behind New Hampshire, which if anybody is from New Hampshire, sorry, but I, I took that personally. <laughs> I was like, what's up with that, you know? Now, this is also from Energy Action Network, and um, again, you don't have to worry about the numbers are really small, but this is just a picture of the buckets of where Vermont's sort of like carbon, you know, like footprint is, is located. And you'll see that we, we have big columns up in transportation and thermal. And then, you know, agriculture, unsurprisingly, pretty high, and then the electricity is relatively low there. Yeah, this is all just sort of taking all of the carbon dioxide emissions that Vermont emits and then putting them into the categories based on, on sector. And what, what did you do? Did you all bar? Um, I, so different years. Different years and like a little like projections into the future. And that's why they get smaller. Um, but mostly that's just a, a quick snapshot of where we're at. And um, importantly, we're going to be talking about the electricity sector and how we get our electrical energy a decent amount tonight. And I just wanted to say that like, even though that bar is so small down there um, in the blue, um, it's important that we get this figured out because our solutions for thermal and transportation are mostly about electrifying. And so as we switch to heat pumps or as we move over to electric vehicles, um, those bars will go down. But if we're getting our electricity from natural gas or from like, you know, high polluting, like bio burning wood for electricity, um, the blue bar is going gonna, is gonna to go up. Um, and yeah, this is just a disclaimer to say that like, um, the best thing that we can do is actually just consume less energy. And so energy reduction is really like the number one thing to do. And that includes things like weatherization and um, demand response. So like when days are really hot and cold, how can we shave our, our peak loads? Um, this is all sort of jargony energy world talk, but 
Um, and that's obviously something that we really would like to see. A good example of that is solar. Um, and obviously solar is like an awesome solution and we'd love to see a lot more solar in Vermont. Um, and we also like, as a climate and energy justice organization, um, we ask key questions of like, where are these resources coming from and who does it impact if it is not impacting us? Um, this chart on the left, it says proportion of US reserves within 35 miles of um, indigenous reservation. And so, as you can see, over three quarters of all of US mineral reserves that we're like mining, extracting to produce solar panels is really, really close to indigenous reservations. And so it's just something to like keep in mind that like all of this stuff is really complicated and um, the future solution to this energy predicament we're in is not to produce more and more and more and more energy in a clean, green way um, because that has its host of problems too. Okay, so how do we like figure this sort of stuff out? Like what, what are the questions that are, are through lines as we think about what to advocate for and what to stay away from? Um, roughly, I would say these are four things that are important to us. Um, is how is this energy source interacting with other social inequities that might be present? Um, thinking of like, you know, mining on indigenous reservations, like that is like a continuation of a history of extraction and oppression of like hundreds of years. And so that's something that we wanna keep in mind. Um, obviously who is being negatively impacted by this energy source? Um, is it in Vermont or are we like putting it off somewhere where we don't have to see or worry about it? That's, that is one of sort of the key issues in Vermont here. Um, who is being positively impacted by this energy production? A very good way to just like question to lead you to who you sometimes need to be suspicious of. <laughs> like who's making the money, but also like whose image is being boosted. And in many ways I would argue that like, you know, my conception of myself as a, as a Vermonter, even though I'm new to here, um, becomes like my, myself and like Vermont's entire image is, is boosted when we think of ourselves as an environmentalist state, right? Um, and so we sort of has, have an incentive not to think about these things and to just sort of like put it aside. And then finally, um, does this energy source have potential for greenwashing? Does it actually reduce uh, carbon going up into the atmosphere, um, regardless of whether it's called renewable or not? So has anybody heard of the term greenwashing before? Is that some hands? Who would feel comfortable sort of giving a, a definition to the group? Yeah, Bob, you want to? Yeah, greenwashing is, um, as Connor was suggesting, it's it's kind of like a false solution. So it it plays well in the press. It plays well with um, if you can get the customers of your utility or something to believe that that they're really being green by doing something like this. A good example is. Castle. Vermont Gas Systems, who is trying to harvest methane from the largest landfill in New York City, from in New York State, rather, over by Buffalo. And they propose that they can take, capture methane gas, compress it into trucks, take it to a pipeline and inject it, which is a 50-year-old one, and then it'll go clockwise around Lake Erie and finally end up in Vermont. So Vermont customers will see, you know, microns of that, quote, renewable gas, and it's, it's a sham. You know, it's just a, a, it's too good to be true, it's not going to be true. So <laughs> be, be wary of it. Um, any other any other sort of additions to that idea of greenwashing or examples that you want to, to put out there? Yeah. And if you want to just shout it, I think yeah. it might be easy. You know, I think it's like you see uh, advertisements uh, from like uh, the, the oil companies that they you know they have a green thing with some uh, wind turbines and mm -hmm. that this is what they're doing now or and but is you, you know 
it's sort of like trying to put a good image on whatever it is that they're doing, and it, it, but often it's not real. Yeah, yeah no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think of like, I don't know if y'all listen to The Daily, it's like a podcast by the New York Times, and every once in a while ExxonMobil will have an ad come on, and they're talking about like, their awesome carbon capture efforts or something like that, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, and then also like, I, another example is like my, my girlfriend's mom gave us like these reusable baggies, you know, and they're like cute or whatever, and and like also like made of plastic, but like more durable plastic, and, and it's like a smiley cat, and it's like, you are saving thousands of plastic bags from entering into a landfill or something like that. And it, it's just like, it's really not that much, like, come on. <laughs> so, some, some small examples. Anyways, all of that to say, um, this isn't to specifically pick out Green Mountain Power, this is just a pattern that utility companies across the country are doing, but um, our utilities are generally claiming that our electricity is really, is green. Um, and for folks who can't read the subtext down here, it says annual energy mix, um, Green Mountain Power supply is 100% carbon free and more than 78% renewable, um, which is awesome. Like if I, you know, I'm, if I was a customer of Green Mountain Power, I would look at that and say, like, great, I don't need to do anything about this, right? Um, but when we like look into the proportions of what's actually going on, only 20% of that 78% renewable that they they claimed really only actually came from solar or wind, which are like the really good stuff that, that we like with battery storage and stuff like that. Can you focus on the better? I'm not really sure if I, I can, but... Wait, well, there. Okay. That's good. All right, and what I'll also do is send these slides to everybody who, if you'd like to take a look after this, this event, too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Will that be available? Yes, yeah, yeah, this will be all available and recorded, so. Um, and, again, don't worry, this is a lot of words, you don't have to read it all, <laughs> but this is a breakdown of the rest of what they consider renewable, and we put sort of like a frowny face next to a lot of the stuff that we're not huge fans of, and things like natural gas are showing up on here, and methane and um, hydroelectric power, really big hydroelectric power. And so, um, you know, when we really like started digging into this at 350 Vermont, we're like, how, how the heck can this happen? This, this is really interesting. Why, is, why do you think hydro is not renewable? Yeah, um, that was a great lead into my next slide. <laughs> so uh, hydropower, um, it, it, you know, again, a lot of this is like, this isn't like capital T truth. If you have a different opinion about this, that's totally okay. Um, but this is specifically um, mega dams, which are different than like hydro that's captured from running, running water, which is a lot of what we see in Vermont. Um, so the closest mega dam that we get a lot of our electricity from is Hydro-Quebec. Have folks heard about Hydro-Quebec before? Seeing some nods, some, some no's. Um, so Hydro-Quebec is a big dam up in, up in Canada and provides a significant chunk of Vermont's electricity. Um, and despite the fact that, you know, it's, it's about 3.8 million square acres, um, Vermont's like 5.8 or something like that. So to get a sense, this is flooding like, you know, two thirds of Vermont or something like that and then letting all of that vegetation decompose. And so that methane gets released over the span of decades, and that's the carbon, or the greenhouse gas emissions that we're talking about. Um, but there are accounting loopholes where it just disappears and nobody accounts for it. But we get our electricity from that, it's considered completely like carbon-free, awesome stuff. Um, and then as we think about our other like justice-related questions, again, this is mostly talking about flooding indigenous lands, um, and um, like what happens when we export the harms of our energy use um, into places where we, we don't need to kind of see it or, or look at it, so. Question. Wait, I have a question or a comment? Yeah, so I'm gonna go through this one 
and then one other relatively complicated one, <laughs> and then we'll have some time for questions, if that's OK. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll just hold it for now, if that's OK. Yeah, thank you. Um, and to give you a sense that, um, of where Vermont is at, no other New England state allows large hydrogen to be considered renewable. Um, so to bring it back to this, the big list of like where we get our renewable energy from, um, yeah, again, the thing that stood out to me was how, how does natural gas get in there? or like methane, and that's like a fossil fuel. Like, at least for hydrogen, we can just argue about the definition of renewable and like, you know, lobby to have that be snuck in, but it seems like natural gas is like a glaring red flag, right? Well, there's these things called renewable energy credits, um, and this is a really kind of wonky policy thing, um, but that's sort of the point, is that the more complicated you make this, the less easy it is to understand. So I'm gonna to try to walk it through with you because it's an important part of how all of our utilities um, buy and sell our electricity and heat. And like it's as a customer um, and consumer of energy, I think it's, it's important to know. So. so a REC is basically like a sticker that you get awarded for producing electricity that is considered good. And generally speaking, like, this is a good thing, right? Like, if we want to incentivize, uh, like, solar production or something, then let's give you a sticker, and you get to sell that sticker off for, like, additional money or something like that. And that's a, it's a market-based solution for, um, for, you know, like, encouraging the production of this, of this type of energy. Um, a way... Oh, sorry. And this says unbundled RECs, and that's an important thing here because that means that you can separate the certificate from the energy production. And then the certificate starts getting bought and sold and moved around and all this stuff in its own market. So in a way, it's like you have your organic tomato, and the sticker kind of saying it's organic is the REC, the unbundled REC. And what energy companies are doing are peeling off that sticker, they buy the sticker, they put it on something else, conventional tomato, AKA our fossil gas electricity, and then they sell you that tomato and say, buy this organic tomato. Isn't it lovely? Why shouldn't you eat? You should eat some more. <laughs> um, so that's sort of a, a basic analogy for this. Um, still, like, you know, it's okay. Like, we're still, a, incentivizing the growth of organic tomatoes, right? Like, shouldn't that be a good thing? I think that to come back to this, what, what, when it really becomes a problem is when states have different bars for like what, when you get a rec and when you don't. And so because Vermont allows hydrogen, large, or sorry, large hydropower to be renewable, what happens is this shell game starts to happen where Utilities buy really cheap stickers from Canada to satisfy Vermont's requirements. And then they sell their expensive solar and wind stickers over to Massachusetts and Connecticut so that they can keep running fossil fuel peaker plants and providing electricity. Um, so that's complicated and confusing, but um, that's sort of like the situation uh, two years ago when we started realizing that we really needed to act on our electricity and our energy sector um, of why we were like, these are two really important things that are going on that really feels like it's greenwashing the way that Vermont produces and consumes energy. And again, this all comes back to like these, these as our guiding questions. Um, who is it impacting? Who is it positively impacting? And all of that stuff. So. Um, that was a decent bit of information, and I think what might help is to group up, and I think groups of two or three would be ideal here, and if you could spend just between like five or six minutes to just really be like, okay, like, what is something that I took away from this that was interesting or surprising um, that I learned, and also, what do I have questions about? What do I want to learn more about? And um, Emma and I are going to be coming around with sticky notes. 
And um, if you have like a really burning question that you want to have answered, then write your question down on the sticky note. And um, once we come back together, we can do a quick Q&A. But if you write it down on the sticky note, we can like email you after this event and make sure that your, your question gets answered. Does that make sense, what we're doing? Okay, so um, find about a buddy, a, a trio, and let's talk for, for about six minutes. So what's something that, that you learned that you're taking away from that section? Understand their literature. That's a very big Oh, 
questions let's spend maybe about five minutes for this one then we can go into the next section because um, I want to make sure we have time to get through the content and then we'll, we can have time for questions and answers at the end as well um, so is there any like burning questions or things that you think clarifying questions that might help the whole group too and I might take like two or three and then try to answer them together yeah okay I'm curious as to why in other states the amount of carbon that is released from hydro projects is um, counted and why it is not included from the hydro quick source. I thought we corrected that problem. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Um, and then another question. Does somebody raise a hand over here? Do you? Can you, are you going to answer that one first? Or? Um, it's going to bundle the question. I was, yeah, it's best, okay. Unbundled <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the other questions we had was how many, or how much of, do the other New England states actually purchase from Hydro Quebec? Is it comparable in terms of the quantity that they're purchasing versus what Vermont does? Okay. Any other, any other uh, Hydro Quebec questions? And uh, yeah, is I two things. One is I don't understand the, the methane generation, and okay. two is is there a real model about this? interaction of nature and what we're doing or not doing? Um, can you say more about that second, about, you said a model about? A model, in other words, if we flood up an area or, oh, gotcha. or how does that eat, affect other things, but we also get electricity, which is better? How are we evaluating this surface? Got you, okay. Um, so, I don't actually know if I can give 100% satisfying answers to all any three of those, but um, I am I'm certain to try my best, um, and I'll, I'll get in touch with our electricity policy team too for for some of these answers um, to, in a follow up. But so 
about the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions accounting um, for Hydro-Quebec, um, I'm not, we might have fixed that problem, or it was, I think the, the current res that was just passed is closing loopholes there, um, but there might have already been something that I, I wasn't aware of in terms of um, being able to start counting those. Um, and when it comes to other states in New England, I'm not actually sure what their policies are in terms of if they count the emissions or if they are if they just like don't consider it renewable um, because they understand that the loophole happens. Um, but like I don't know where it goes into their uh, carbon accounting or not. Um, um, there are some models about the methane release of flooding. Um, flooding massive areas of vegetation um, that I'd be happy to try to connect connect with you. Um, and generally speaking, like, you know, when, when living stuff dies and decomposes, um, if it's not in like a really healthy ecosystem way, like gas gets released. And that is pretty much what's happening there. Um, and as the water levels rise, there's all this, like, sometimes the gas gets trapped in the water and so the timing gets like kind of off in, in terms of it's not all releasing right when the floods, the floods happen. Um, and I took three and then I forgot your question. <laughs> um, how much do other New England states actually purchase from hydro? Oh, sweet, yes, thank you. So pretty much, as far as I'm aware, almost all, every state purchases some Hydro-Quebec, it's, it's a huge energy source in terms of electricity. Um, and Vermont is proportionally, I think, the most reliant state um, on, on that for our electricity production, yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, I, I guess one thing is, there definitely is like a, it's already flooded, so maybe we should just use the electricity because the damage has already been done. Like, that's an argument that folks have said, and um, that's a thing. <laughs> but um, because of our reliance on that, like, we, we've been following some news headlines about, like, if Hydro-Quebec is planning to expand. And so they are a company, they're trying to make money, and the more demand that we give them, the more they are willing to continue expanding. And um, it, it seems likely that they are trying to increase New England's reliance on their electricity because it's a good climate transition. And that way, like, they're seeing this as a growth opportunity uh, in terms of, like, market terms. So. Okay, um, I think let's move on to the next section. And um, folks want to sidebar with me about Rex anytime, I'm down. <laughs> Wonky policy stuff. So, this is going to be a bit faster, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about like moving from electrons to elections, and essentially like where are the power dynamics at play in Vermont? And as 350 Vermont is a grassroots organization, and we're trying to build people power um, in order to get the change that we want to see done, right? But in order to do that, we need to be smart, and and we need to target like the other power sources in the state that makes sense. And understand where our opponents for whatever thing we're working on are also like looking at. So when you think about um, getting electricity, at least when I think about it, and when I was putting it onto a bad slideshow, I think like, you know, you got your solar panels or your fossil fuel plant, it goes through those power lines and then it gets to your house. Now, I think like, Physically, that's pretty much the bare bones that, that's important to know. Um, but when we also talk about the more like non-physical realm of power and who's making these decisions, um, utility companies are going to be a really important part of this puzzle, right? They're the folks who um, make money by buying and selling us electricity and, and heat. Of course, we have the state house and which people can try to advocate and push for carrots or sticks on if they should do this or not produce that. We have um, the executive branch, um, which, I don't know, their function is vetoing everything under the sun. <laughs> um, but there's also like the Agency of National Resources, the Department of Public Service, and these are big institutions that like execute bills that are passed, right? And so like a lot of times, um, 
bills like the, the res or other things, studies that come out of the Montpelier State House will then be implemented, like they'll be completed by the Department of Public Service, and then they'll go back to the State House to get voted on or not. And so there's a, there's a pretty intimate relationship between Phil Scott's executive branch and um, the State House. And then I think finally, there's this thing called the Public Utility Commission, uh, which is short for PUC. And that's also essentially part of the executive branch. Um, there are three folks who are appointed by Phil Scott, and they actually hold a really surprising amount of power when it comes to um, approving or regulating um, energy projects in our state. Who here has heard of the PUC or the Public Utilities Commission? All right, a decent amount of hands, that's awesome. Um, because it's a super arcane thing that is actually really important to understand. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the utilities and the PUC um, because 350 Vermont has sort of identified, and many other people too, not just us, have identified these as important power players to know and understand that like these are folks that we need to interact with. I'm not saying they're bad or good necessarily. Um, I think that because granted that the status quo is bad, I would say that we need to work on these things, um, but there it is. So utilities, um, three major functions, the generation of energy, the transmission, and the distribution of energy. Um, in Vermont, we have, I would say like basically two different types of utilities. Um, we have our, our smaller cooperatives like Washington Electric Co-op, which I'm sure y'all are, are familiar with. Um, publicly or, or member owned. I live in Burlington. We have Burlington Electric Department over there, which is part of the city. Um, there's smaller service areas and uh, they often have their hands tied on some things because of like a smaller rate base or less capital to, to do things with. Uh, and then we have our larger utilities that are investor owned. Um, your map on the left here is from Velco and it's a match of electric service areas. So. Everything in light green, it, Green Mountain Power um, operates and services, and that is the company that we were breaking down with the numbers in our last section. Um, green Mountain Power and Vermont Gas are both investor owned, despite really friendly marketing strategies. They are like owned by international investment corporations. Um, I think Vermont Gas, at least, is in Canada. Um, they have pretty large service areas. They have really powerful lobbying arms. Vermont Gas specifically hires a lot of lobbyists, um, great communications team, <laughs> and they have a mixed history of, of good and bad programs. Um, you know, like, I, these utilities are generally doing some cool, innovative stuff in the state, um, but also Vermont Gas tried to build a, you know, a gas pipeline through Addison County like five years ago and violated a bunch of environmental permits and all of this stuff. So to pretend that they're like really good guys is, is not a great idea. We also have our Public Utilities Commission. Um, this is a body that exists in, in all 50 states. Um, they're appointed by governors, they're quasi-judicial, so they like definitely have this vibe where you like you show up and you have to submit like briefs and they like and like lawyers are arguing and, and they like approve it or not approve it. So I honestly thought it was like the Vermont's legal court system, but it's not. It's just three people that Phil Scott appoints who he likes, who get to decide all of these things. Um, in Vermont, um, they, they regulate a little bit more than just electricity and gas, um, and there's a big revolving door between like the Department of Public Service and, and the PUC. Um, somebody who's on it right now served as a legislator for a couple of years, um, they serve really long terms, and it's not clear how long the term lasts. This, everybody on now has been between five and 12 years. And, um, you know, they're really smart people. Like, they have a lot of experience in, in government and bureaucracy, uh, but I think an important flag here is none of them have climate experience, um, and none of them have energy transition experience, or ratepayer advocacy, or in other words, like how is this going to affect low and moderate income Vermonters and pay paying the rates? And so I think as we look to improve the Public Utilities Commission, it would be really great to think about requiring or adding members who, who bring that sort of expertise to all this stuff. So uh, 
two sort of like headlining PUC things that have happened recently is they really like to deny uh, energy projects based on aesthetic grounds, um, which is a thing. Vermont's pretty, let's keep it there. And I think solar panels make it more pretty. Um, and then Bob mentioned earlier this uh, landfill pipeline that would like pipe in gas kind of all around the country almost. And that was just recently approved by the Public Utilities Commission last fall. So ultimately, um, 350 Vermont, like we're looking at all of this and we're saying there's a balance of power in Vermont, right? We have our policymakers and our, and our implementers. And right now, like it's leaning on the end of people who make money off of power, like of, of electron power, <laughs> and have decision-making power in order to keep it that way. And, and I think, I'm gonna skip those slides, but a couple of really quick examples of this is, um, is that these, these companies have essentially gotten really close to regulatory capture of our climate bills. And so uh, the Affordable Heat Act was a bill that was, was like, it was like two years ago, I think, and it's basically like on our heating, how are we gonna like do the climate transition for heat? And it was passed and it was like, okay, let's get a group of people together to like figure out what's clean heat and what's not clean heat and how we should like phase them out. And all of the arrows here are industry representatives that are in that circle who get to decide what's clean and what's not. Um, mostly for biofuels, which is like not, it's like natural gas, but like coming out of a landfill or coming from cow poop or something like that. Um, most recently, the RES, which were, we, was just passed, it was sort of the big electricity climate bill of this session. Um, this summer, the legislator was like, we need to get together all of the stakeholders to hash this out and try to come to a compromise so we're not all like screaming at each other in, in February. It's a pretty good idea, right? But take a look at like who is in that group. We definitely have some folks that we like, like some climate and housing groups, but like overrepresented, I would say, are the industry and utility representatives. Um, and this is like the state of affairs, the status quo, whenever there's a climate bill or environmental bill that is trying to get passed in Vermont. Um, so just the, I would say like the status of affairs is that like the environmental movement has some power, but it's not even close to the power that we need in order to challenge folks who are making money off of this. So ultimately what we're trying to do is organize in a way that we're like coordinating and bringing folks together in order to tip the balance of power um, towards this direction. And really like look at this chart and ask where can we intervene? You know, I think that 350 Vermont has done a lot of legislative work this past year, but we could also like run campaigns on the PUC. We could be doing specifically targeting Phil Scott and the executive branch and like what we need to do to, to shape up Vermont's like governmental bodies and all of that. And so, yeah, ultimately we're trying to build nodes, take local action. The 350 Montpelier node is the folks who organized this event tonight. And we network all of us together to take action on state policy. And so um, it's a really great model because we can do things like, um, you know, there's a senator in Bennington who's, who's waffling. He might flip on the veto override for the rents. And something that we can do is like, go and activate all of our 350 folks down there and go and give them a little bit of hell so that he can like remember that his, constitu his constituents want action. Um, so I think that was, the, that was the end of the power section. Um, and it's really just the idea is to get, get thinking about like who are the power players out there and what we need to do as a grassroots movement to, to kind of like combat that power. Um, and I think the last thing we have to do before pizza is do a little bit of a legislative recap. But, but first, I think it would be worth um, doing a quick kind of, again, turn and pair share and just talk about your thoughts about what was just presented here. Um, again, if you have any questions, you can write them on sticky notes. Um, but again, this is sort of like a processing learning exercise too, so you can just chat with everybody around you too.
Okay, another like five minutes for that. We'll be good. I don't really know where to start. It seems so frustrating. Um, so many more you guys are probably better wonks than What? So you two guys are probably better wonks on this than me. Well, you know, he wants to organize constituents, but I have not seen any program what they want done versus what's being done. Oh, well, I think he's got, it's going to cover that because it's going to be a section when he's going to talk about what passed was and hopefully talk about you know, what was good and what was bad and what needed to be done. He is going to have another part then. I didn't yeah. get that. Yeah. I thought he said it was already done. Well, I want to see what you wrote. I mean, I think, I think that's what's coming when he talks about well, construction. It sure leads us up in there. Well, I hope that's what I really came for. See if you feel the same way when you finish me. I know, and I thought other yeah. any bills that they have that are trying to say for qualifications the Public Utility Commission members need to have. In other words, does there need to be diversity? That's something the legislators can do. But and, they he, and he said that that's one of the things we need to make happen. Yeah. Yes. Happened. I, I right. right Nobody now, has put anything in about that. The 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 and one of them is the the Senator's the wife. The What's the 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 What is our other
So we're going to move. Um, yeah, and just, let's do some questions um, for just again, like just take a couple questions now, um, and then we'll talk briefly about the bills that were passed uh, this session and and what 350 Vermont was able to do to help get that make that happen. Yeah, Mary Alice. I, I wanted to ask. Uh, what, uh, are there any requirements for sitting on the Public Utility Commission? Is that something that the legislature could put, make, have they made any bills on that about trying to make requirements that there should be consumers and people, not all people that are Wall Street invested in sure. public utilities? Um, yeah, so the question is sort of, also, I'm going to take that and go a little bit more broadly. Like, what are the options for trying to fix the PUC? And the, the question is, are, is there a way that we could sort of require, have requirements, expertise, et cetera? Um, I think, like most governmental appointments, um, there's sort of like an implicit requirement. Um, I, there's no explicit requirements that I'm aware of at, right now. Um, but, you know, if you appoint somebody who's really bad at the education of secretary position or something like that, like you're going to get some blowback. Um, and I think that there might be a role that we could play as a grassroots movement to really be like, this. these three positions are you know, just as important to us as the secretary of education. And we really want to see our governor, if he cares about our future, like appoint people who care about our future or something. Yeah, I mean, we haven't talked about doing that, but that would be pretty cool to see the environmental movement perhaps put forward like a slate of candidates. Or... I think it would be great, and I also think it would be great um, legislation to increase the number of commissioners on. Mm -hmm. Right, increasing the number of commissioners, definitely a, a potential. That would be cool. Um, or so, or a rotational. Yeah, or having term limits, right? Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, I'm sure folks have heard of Third Act before, environmental group of, of folks um, in their Third Act. And um, they have specifically taken on the PUC as an issue that they'd like to look into. Um, and so I think 350 Vermont is really willing to like support and move and educate. Uh, we're not running any spe specific campaigns at this moment, or probably won't be for the next like six months to a year, I would say. Um, but there are groups looking into this. So if you're really jazzed up about the PUC, um, I would recommend getting in touch with Third Act first. Um, yeah. I think if I'd seen this uh, a year and a half ago, I, I wouldn't have been surprised. But part of me is sort of shocked because aren't people at large uh, better educated at this point after the flooding last summer of Barry and Montpelier, et cetera. Wasn't it out there? Um, I mean, I guess I can't speak, speak, you know, like with facts about that. I would say from anecdotal experience, people are much more scared after the floods and um, Could you repeat the question? Some of yeah, here. sorry about that. The, the question is after the floods of last summer, um, you know, are people more educated on these issues? Like, why do we still have to do something like this, basically? Um, and I get from anecdotal experience as, as organizing for the past, like, two years, um, I think the anxiety and the fear levels have increased, but, but not necessarily um, the, like, what to do about it or the, the participation or organization in, in action. Um, and so, that's why we're we're trying to trying to get the word out and and drum up some support. I guess um, it's definitely important, and it's, it's good to hear that. I think we we understand that the climate crisis can affect us now, and I think that was a pivot point from last summer. That that's different. But yeah, yeah. Let's do like y'all's two questions, and then we'll probably talk a little bit about the bills, and want to make sure there's time for beats out. I, so this may be not totally to the point, but. What is your personal or 350.org's personal opinion about why people aren't more uh, engaged? Like, what's going on? 
Is sure. it the internet distractions? Is it looking at puppy videos? Is it, you know, what, what's going on? Um, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I think, I don't know. <laughs> but I do know that, like, it can be hard to be a part of a grassroots social movement sometimes because it takes 50 of us to counteract like one lobbyist that Vermont gas pays or something, or you know maybe even more. And so that can be a little bit frustrating sometimes when we're like, you know, to go back to the, 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 the seesaw slide, like right now we're down here and it can be kind of crappy sometimes to like start being the person bouncing on the other end, but like you don't have enough people down there. And so um, I feel like that's that's a bit of it, but yeah, Casey. Well, I was just going to say, um, having been affected pretty dramatically by the flood last summer, I um, I would have hoped that that would have been an opportunity for our leadership to say, okay, folks, wake up. We're not safe here in Vermont. We've got to really we've got to really move some stuff here and, and do something about this. But we didn't have that experience. We didn't. We didn't. We didn't. The, the governor. I don't. I don't recall any presence of the governor coming to Montpelier or, I mean, I know he's been involved with Barry, but that's where he's from. Um, and and uh, there's been so little leadership from the top and it's all been kind of, you know, we have we have legislators here in Barry and in Montpelier that, that did get legislation passed this year for flood recovery, but it's been more uh, from underneath than, you know, it's been grassroots rather than grass tops. Yeah, so, well. To address that question, I think we're talking about beliefs, right, and political beliefs, and I work with some people, my eyes have been open lately, I work with some people who are very, I would consider them very well educated. They will not believe in climate change. They just refuse to see it. Right, and the fact that climate has become a political issue is, is really, is a, you know, well, it's, it's just such a, dis, a dissociating situation, you know, because it's like the climate is the climate and the change is the change and it's not, it's not anyone's politics or beliefs that are going to, I mean, the politics can sink us. Yes. They, I have read that there are supposedly like 85% of people in the U.S. have experienced some kind of climate event in the last several years and when you look at like people in Florida where sea level rise in the coastal area around Miami has been six inches since 2010. And you have a governor there who's saying, let's remove the words climate change or climate stuff from all of our literature. Mm. And then we'll, you know, we won't, That's a then, then we'll get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, it can be really, really scary stuff. Um, but I definitely can say, as an organizer and as a, a former volunteer for 350 Vermont, like organizing works, it can be hard, you know, and like you don't win all of the campaigns, but like it really does work. And I think that this legislative session was actually a, a, an example of that. Like uh, there were a really great slate of bills that were passed. Um, we, I mean, we had the flood recovery stuff. We had the, the Climate Make Polluters Pay Act. and. Um, for 350 Vermont specifically, we decided to put our energy into three bills, uh, the Renewable Energy Standard, the RES, which reforms electricity, um, Thermal Energy Networks, which is a new kind of like heating technology for larger buildings, and um, ratepayer protection, uh, making sure that we're covering our low and moderate income Vermonters from rate spikes as we transition our energy. And um, we had legislators and and environmental lobbyists alike tell us when we started out with three legislative priorities that there was no way that we were ever gonna get all three of them passed. And right now we have all three um, that have been passed through various different different bills and things like that. So it's great um, and um, it's, an, it's a testament to the, the statewide organizing we've, we've been able to pull off. Um, anyway, so do you wanna talk a little bit about what the bills do and sure. then, yeah. I feel like you, you kind of got it there. Hi everyone, I'm Emma. Um, I'm also a community organizer with 350 Vermont. Um, so I guess I'll just share a little bit about Thermal Energy Networks and ratepayer protection, um, and then I'll let Connor take the res, which is sort of the 
huge bill that uh, passed and was just vetoed this session. Um, so there's some updates there that are interesting. Um, so thermal energy networks, who here knows what those are? Does anybody feel like they want to share what a thermal energy network is? Bob? A thermal energy <laughs> network is a linked together system of geothermal systems. So you might think that there's, uh, and it's shared energy, so they're all piped together. So there might be a business that needs a lot of energy during the day because you're manufacturing, but at night they have all this heat still coming out of their system that can be shared with people that have come home from working somewhere else and doing it there. Um, and it's, it's geothermal would be very costly if you did a one-off, one residence, one business, but if you pair it all together, then there's a link system that flows together. Right, so um, it's affordable, it's efficient, um, it is local, and so that means we're not importing um, our, our fuel needed for heat. Um, it's relatively carbon neutral. It lowers grid demand. Um, and I guess one thing I'll add is that you can capture um, waste heat and distribute it through the network. So um, it's sort of like an awesome recycling um, distribution network. Um, and so the TENS bill itself, that, um, that would make it possible for municipalities to actually build thermal energy networks. Right now the PUC doesn't have a system for um, setting those up. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to ratepayer and I'm going to get back to where those bills are at right now, but ratepayer protection is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's, well actually it's not exactly what it sounds like. It's a study. Um, so this bill is a study, it, sorry, this bill would require the Public Utilities Commission to execute a study figuring out how to fund um, a rate payer protection system. So um, more specifically, it would be figuring out how to cap electricity rates at a certain percentage of a household's income, which is really important, um, especially as we're thinking about electrifying everything. So our electric bills are just gonna go up and you need to make sure that that transition is accessible for everyone and affordable. Um, so sort of as Connor mentioned, um, this, these, these two bills were, actually Connor, you didn't mention this, but these two bills were not um, a high priority for the legislature this session. Um, the renewable energy standard was going through and I'm sure you all have heard about Act 250 being reformed. They, like, the legislature just had a lot to focus on. Um, so these two bills originally didn't even get picked up, um, but in order to sort of tip power back to the people, um, we organized, um, we re-strategized with um, allied legislators, and we got both of these bills submitted as amendments to a PUC miscellaneous bill that's relatively uncontroversial and it's sitting on the governor's desk. And Can you we, name the numbers on these bills? Oh yes, it's S three hundred five, Senate Bill three hundred five. Senate or House? Senate. S means the Senate. That's a lot of information. Um, <laughs> I was going to dry right. Yeah, I hope that that makes sense. Um, okay. Yeah. Cool. And then um, H two eighty nine, H two eight nine is the number for the res. Um, and it does a whole lot of stuff, but I would say the most important thing is that before this, uh, utilities thought that the, they interpreted the law to say that they could only make up to 10% of their energy from like in-state renewables. Um, and I, we think that that ceiling was sort of like, they were reading that generously for themselves. And, <laughs> and, but. Um, this changes it so that they have to make at least 20% of their electricity from in-state renewables. 
still, you know, it's only a fifth of our electricity that's coming from Vermont itself, but that's okay. Like, Vermont's borders are a construction, and like, we can get our energy from like nearby is the goal. Um, so 20% renewable energy from Vermont and 100% renewable energy by 2035, um, full stop period. Um, now, obviously, as I, and, oh, and, the, and then the, the last biggest thing is that um, I talked to you about large hydro and hydro Quebec, and the res um, says that all of our existing contracts with hydro Quebec are okay, like you can still use that, you can still count that, but um, I'm gonna read it so I get it right. New large hydro expansions of existing large hydro and expansions of existing biomass are not counted as new renewables, um, which we see as a really, really good big win too. So, um, these are uh, fact sheets from Renewable Energy Vermont um, about the the res, and it has a little bit about the, the cost of the res because there's this whole drama that we can talk about over pizza if you want to hear more about it, about like how much is it going to cost, and the governor was like wildly overinflating the cost, and so you can learn more about that um, through reading this fact sheet. Excuse me, but are you saying that these are two bills that were passed by the legislature and they're going to be, that's, that this, these are the ones that Scott has not approved and what? Yeah, thanks for clarifying. So, I just um, wanted to make sure of that. Came. Right, so the legislative session, the regular session has ended. Um, both of these bills were passed and Scott has not vetoed the thermal energy networks and the ratepayer protection, we expect that he's just gonna let it slide. Um, but he has vetoed the rents, the electricity bill. Which and, is that? Well, which number? Name the bill. So he has vetoed H289. Sorry, bill numbers don't work in my head, so I assume it's not important. <laughs> um, and that, that bill number, so the veto session is, is gonna be in July. And June. oh, June. Sorry, June. Um, June seventeenth. Okay. And um, fortunately, we have some pretty good legislators here in Montpelier, and Watson has been receptive and um, is is a yes vote for the res for now. Um, but definitely worth contacting your representatives to ensure that um, they're they're ready to very enthusiastically lock in that veto override. It has to be House members, so Senate has nothing to do with no, no, both. Both. both have to be two-thirds. There we go. So, it, yeah, so contact all of your representatives. Um, the, I think the H and the S are because that's where it came from originally. But, um, okay. Yeah. Legislative process is kind of confusing, right? <laughs> but we'll get through it. <laughs> Each House, the House and the Senate both have to override by two-thirds. Yes. Okay, the House and the Senate both have to override by two-thirds, is what Bob said. No. Could you say the number again of the bill? Yeah, H289. And um, we'll also send this all in an email. So. All right. All right, so I think that's it for today. Um, I believe we have pizza waiting in the wings, stage right. And um, we'll bring that out. And we have the space booked for another half hour, so um, we'd love for you to stay around and chat if uh, you have anything. So, so thank you, everybody.